Hi, this is Shauna. Before we get to today's guest, I want to take a minute to learn more about you, the listener. We've put together a short survey at fueltalent.com slash podcast to gather information on who's listening and to give you a chance to make suggestions and comments about the show. I want What Fuels You to be a great resource for you and your interests, and I hope these interviews give you practical advice along with inspiration for your career and life. Help us continue to serve you better by going to fueltalent.com slash podcast. Thank you so much. Now let's start today's show. Hi, this is Shauna, the CEO and founder of Fuel Talent. One of the things I have loved most in my 25-year recruiting career has always been the stories that people tell. Stories of leadership, career choices, company ideas, and team building. My inspiration for starting the What Fuels You podcast came from being curious about people's lives and wanting to help share their stories. What path brought them to this place? What decisions did they make that led to failures and successes? Who influenced those decisions and what lessons were learned along the way? I hope you enjoy the What Fuels You podcast. Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is Andy Healy. Andy is the third generation family member to lead Seattle-based Continental Mills, makers of Krusty's Pancake and Baked Mixes and Wild Roots Snacks, among other high quality tasty products. Andy lives and breathes Continental Mills, having touched nearly every aspect of the business throughout his 19 years with the company, including roles in sales, marketing, research and development, and operations. He served as the company president and chief growth officer since 2015 and was named president and CEO in 2019. His love for food and passion for people is the perfect formula to successfully manage the family-owned food business. Andy was born and raised in the Seattle area, where he was a state champion and All-American distance runner at Eastside Catholic. He then attended Georgetown University on a track scholarship and earned his MBA at Georgetown as well. Andy currently lives in the Seattle area, where he loves to make Krusty's pancakes on the weekends with his wife, Courtney, son, Wyatt, and daughter, Maggie. Welcome, Andy. So fun to have you on the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Good to see you. Okay, I'm going to kick it off with some rapid fire. Are you ready? Yes. So okay. ready. This is, this is actually like fun. Are you waffles or pancakes? Uh, pancakes are easier, but waffles are better. They're just better. Yeah. So if you're out at a restaurant, are you ordering waffles? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you might have like a different taste than most people because you know a good waffle when you take when you get That's it. That's true. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> flapjack and waffle connoisseur. Yes. <laughs> nice. No crepes. No, I love a crepe too. We actually have a crepe mix that we sold exclusively to Walmart and it did okay, but I was really hoping that that was going to be the next pancake. Oh yeah, I would think so. They're to make a, a crepe, you know, they, they think they need a crepe pan or whatever. I know. It's super easy and they're delicious. Well, you have to teach me. I don't know how to make a crepe. Okay, are you beach or mountains? Mountains. And if you could have lunch with anyone, who would you choose? Lunch with anyone? Um... Probably Phil Knight. Oh, Nike. Yeah. Love it. Have yeah. you read that book? Yeah. Uh, Shoe Dog. Yeah. It's my actually Shoe favorite dog. book I've ever read. And oh, seriously? It's kind of a bit. I mean, it, it, I think it would, I was looking it up in Audible. I guess I'd look up business books and it has some business lessons for sure, but it's just a super interesting story. I'm going to take, I'm actually going um, on a trip tomorrow. I'm going to take it. My son read it and loved it. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. It for the is tip. awesome. Okay, I know that you're an athlete, college athlete, but I'm super curious today, what's your favorite sport to watch? Basketball. Like this is prime time. March Madness is March my Madness. favorite. Yes, love it. Are you in a um, March Madness like league or whatever it's called? Like yeah, a, like like 12. And I do a oh, bracket seriously? for everyone. A I bracket. Can't remember who, I, who I picked. And so uh, and then I can't remember actually, you know, how I'm doing because they're all different. But that's hilarious. Yeah, yes, I'm in, I'm in a bunch. Nice. Okay. So in the, I'm guessing you read Shoe Dog a long time ago. So in the past year, what have you read or listened to or seen that you're into and would recommend? This is a selfish question because I'm always looking for, you know. Um, actually, the, the book, the business book, I guess business book I'm, I'm listening to right now. I'm, I, well, I guess it's a life book really is uh, Habit habit Stacking. I think it's called oh. Habit Stacker. No, it's called Atomic it's Habits. Atomic Habits. We did, yes. we did like a little book club at my office and we read that. 
and I, of course, listened, but atomic habits is awesome. Well, habit stacking, like if you're going to brush your teeth, then you also floss and you associate the two. Yeah. And you got to have some incentive to do it. Right. And so, yeah. yeah, So if you like scope, maybe that's what I do. For some reason, I really love scope. So, (laughs) you know, so (laughs) otherwise I'd have like my teeth would be rotting out. I'm sure Courtney's appreciative of that too. Um, Okay. So what would you get up early to do or go to bed late to do? get an extra hour in the day Ooh, uh well to to do um i love skiing so um that's probably the thing that i that gets me out of bed early on a weekend if i'm in sun valley is is to go ski yeah um i love goofing around on the lake so i do a lot of like wake surfing and just swimming and goofing around in the water stay up late i hate to say it but it's usually either work which i love so it doesn't feel like work um or or some like series you know on netflix or something yeah are you watching anything good right now you know what i'm watching right now is golden girls oh shut up. <laughs> oh because betty white just died that's actually not why i think maybe that is what triggered it but my daughter who's 12 is obsessed with golden girls and so, okay i'm writing it down because i have a 12 year old daughter and so maybe she we don't have any shows we watch together um okay super curious who was your childhood hero Quinn Snyder. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Mercer and basketball player who went on to yeah. play at Duke. Yeah, so we, coach of the jazz now. Yeah, coach of the jazz. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so speaking of childhood, I know you're from Seattle. Um, kind of describe your childhood for me and what role kind of being a, a child of like a business leader was for you. Like what role did that play? Was it like, um, the, I, guess I, I guess I'm asking as somebody who grew up also in a family business, was business a topic in the house? It it wasn't. I mean, it was clearly my dad's passion, and so he was super interested in it. But um, there was never sort of any expectation to work at the company. And I think he did a really good job of kind of compartmentalizing and didn't sort of bring work home a lot, um, at least kind of like early childhood. And then as I got to, I think like sixth or seventh grade, I started, you know, doing summer jobs there and things like that. So yeah, it was sort of a, a source of summertime income, but it never like occurred to me to work there until after business school, really. Um, yeah, interesting. And what yeah. were would you sense of like, I feel like families have like a culture or like a set of values. What do you think was important to your parents growing up when you were little? I think, um, yeah, good question. I, I think probably... Um, probably just, you know, family really. Um, it was just really, really supportive family, you know, awesome parents. My dad coached like almost every team I played on. Um, I don't think they missed a sporting event that I participated in. Um, and so just probably that more than anything, really supportive, empathetic, like great parents. Pat and I yeah. disliked each other until after college, but uh, whatever, we were two brothers who fought all the time. I know. I'm like, I hope my kids are going to be like best friends. And I know that you guys are super close. I don't have memories. I mean, for the listeners, I grew up with, with you and Pat. I don't have memories of you guys fighting. I always thought of you guys as just like these remarkable rock star brothers. Yeah, always. no, we fought a ton. We fought a ton, but uh, no, yeah. he was he was a typical big brother. Um, yeah, you beat know, the shit out of you. Yeah, yeah, but then would if I was in a fight, he'd have my back. So he'd, oh he'd, yeah, he'd, only I get to kick Andy's ass. No, nobody else does. So <laughs> that that helped that helped shape you. And yeah. so when you're in like fifth grade, kind of middle school, what were you thinking about as far as like what you wanted to be when you grew up? I was just hoping to graduate from middle school, I think, at the time. Um, yeah, no, as a kid, I I was, uh, you know, I guess everyone wants to be a winner, and I didn't have a lot of W's on the on the on the win-loss bracket, <laughs> if you will. So as far as far as what? Well, I mean, you know, I was a horrible student. I got in a ton of trouble. I was, you know, short and skinny and freckles and in, you know, and Actually, it's funny. My wife, uh, we were talking about scrapbooks earlier, just literally like two weeks ago, found this note from my doctor when I was 13 and I weighed 77 pounds and was four nine when I was 13. No way. Yeah. I don't have any, rec- I don't remember you like that. I mean, I remember like 
in my mind, like an athlete in like a track way, not a football way. Like, yeah. you know, you need to be kind of lean to do the sports you were doing, but that's interesting. Okay. So 13. Wow. Late bloomer. Yeah. 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 So then that was about the age that I realized I was a really good runner. So yeah. Um, but you weren't getting like bullied or anything or were you? No, no. I had like great friends and I was a pretty good basketball player, um, despite being tiny. So yeah, you were really, like, that point, was kind point of guard. Area. what's that? <laughs> were you the point? Yeah, it's definitely the point guard. Yeah, no one's no one was posting me up. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, sports, athletics was kind of the one area that I had some kind of early success in. And then when I found out as a great runner, I was like, oh, terrific! So the, my yeah. one special gift, gift is distance running. Like the one sport you have to do totally by yourself that isn't a ton of fun. And um, but that sort of probably around thirteen was when I started to realize was that was sort of my one special gift. Yeah. Well, that's a good gift to have. It gives you some time to have to reflect unless like now I don't think I could run without music, a podcast, a book. Like I can't be with myself that long in my thoughts. Yeah. How about you? Are you running still? No, I haven't been able to run for like seven years. Um, So I had like, I think it's 10 or 11, uh, like just real simple, but orthoscopic knee surgeries. And so. Oh my God. 10 or 11. Yeah. Yeah. So just would continue to tear my meniscus. Yeah, just, college, I started in high school and then cut throughout college and after college. And so just no, no cartilage left. So unfortunately I can't run. So I can't really do I, any I'm fun surprised sports. you can ski and wake surf. Like those yeah, things are hard on your knees. It is super weird. So I can snow shoe, I can hike, I can ski, I can bike, I can elliptical. Wow. If I do anything that requires any lateral motion, like just call 911 in advance. Cause that's going to be bad. Yeah. Um, no, no tennis. I can't run. Yeah. Yeah. No tennis for you. And so what were you competing in? You said distance running, like what distance? And um, did that kind of help you, I guess, stop getting in trouble? You said you got in trouble. I also slightly remember that, but not, not in like a mischievous way, not in a like, uh uh-oh, he's going down the wrong pathway. Yeah. Yeah. Most of my, when my dad used to say the trouble with trouble is always starts off as fun. And so, yeah most of the trouble I got into is in pursuit of fun, but right. um, yeah, but there was, I, I pursued a lot of fun. So <laughs> I, got a lot of I love, fun. I love that about you. I yeah. always say like when we were coming up with our company values, I'm like, can't we just put fun in there? I was like, number one, Yeah, I'm all, I'm all about fun. I'm like, if I'm not having fun, like what's the point? Yeah. You spend most of your working, at least conscious awake life working. Right. So it's gotta right. be, gotta be fun, but it, um, it's gotta be fun. So running. So what were you competing in exactly? So I started off just, you know, just track. I, um, actually what happened is my, I was shooting hoops. My dad came home and said, Hey, let's go on a run together. And I'd run with him occasionally. And, and so I, he comes out like an hour later and I'm walking in and he says, well, we're going on a run. I'm like, I thought you meant like in five minutes, I'm exhausted. I'm not running. And he said, you know, you committed to running. So you're going to go on a run. And so I took off and I ran our normal little course and I came back. He said, you cut the course. I'm like, no, I didn't. He said, well, that's impossible because you couldn't have run to that point and back already. I mean, so I did. And so he finished running, came home. He's like, okay, you have to do it again. And this time I'm going to drive next to you and watch you. <laughs> and he's <laughs> like, going like 55 miles an hour. Me. Oh, I love your dad. And so and he's like, wow, that's really fast. And so he put me on a track team and, um, and I, yeah, started, started running and kind of realized I was, I was pretty good at it. Yeah. And what age were you when you decided that you may want to pursue it in college? Um, I think probably again, like probably seventh or eighth grade, it became, you know, pretty clear as, you know, you know, finishing, you know, top 10 in the country and stuff and in cross country oh, wow. and, and, uh, track. And so it became, and, and I was like, you know, just way less physically mature than a lot of the kids that were beating me and a lot of kids were behind me. So it, it became pretty clear that I was going to have a chance at, you know, running division one track and, and, you know, yeah. potentially beyond that. So. And Georgetown, I mean, obviously you must've gotten your grades up or they just like overlooked them. Cause today, I mean, I have a little high school athlete. I'm like, it's all about grades. And these kids have to get like a freaking like three, nine to get in anywhere. It's gotten crazy competitive. Yeah. So did you just kick it into high gear in high school? No, no, I was, I was shocked actually that they were going to let me into Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> the truth. In fact, yeah. I what happened was I got I was, I was heading out to attract me, and the you know the uh, school you know, secretary came out and said, "Hey, you got some letters from some colleges, and one of them was Georgetown." So I threw the rest out, stuffed the Georgetown one in my track spikes, and it was last call for the for the mile. And 
And so I was putting my spikes on and I found that letter. I'm like, dang it, I can't, I'm not going to get in there. So I threw it away, ran the race. And like four weeks later, I get a call from this girl, Mindy Snyder, who ran an Issaquah and went to Georgetown on a track scholarship. And she's like, why are you not responding to, to coach? I'm like, I, I'm not getting into Georgetown. And she said, well, we've, we've got some some morons on the team. So I think you have a chance. So, <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> it's, That's crazy. Yeah. So then once you get there, though, you got to survive. You did you how did you do once you were there? Um, yeah, it was really hard. Um, but yeah, I just, um, sort of knew that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to stay eligible. And so, you know, there was, I just had to study a lot harder than I did in, in, in college. And, you know, as an English major and an art minor. So, you know, if it was one of those majors where if you put the work in, you're going to do fine. Yeah. So, so division yeah. one college athlete, amazing. And did you go right on to get an MBA and also kind of like why I always ask people an MBA um you know it's a big commitment and it's it's a lot like why did you go do that was was were you clear that you were going to go pursue the family business at that time no not at all I what happened was um well first of all at my senior year some friends and I started this uh it was like a web design development company when everyone started a web design development company and um and so we kind of goofed around with that my my senior year, but I I was an English major because I thought I wanted to coach track and cross country and be an English teacher in at my old high school. And so after I graduated, I moved back to Seattle, kind of shadowed my my old coach who was an English teacher and and coached cross country and, and track. And um, I mean, this will give you a, a sense for somehow sometimes I don't think things through very well. So I, I think I was like three weeks into it. And it finally occurred to me that all I was doing was like screaming at kids who didn't want to be there. Right. Right? The boys were there because they didn't make the football team. And their parents couldn't pick them up at three fifteen. And <laughs> they're like, "That's awesome." Yeah, and most of the girls were where there's like a jogging club. Like, it's so all of a sudden I'm like, "Wait a minute, that's right. I was the only person that was into this." Yes, that's and so, so. I sort of imagine coaching a bunch of me's and like yes. I'm, catch, I'm catching the kids smoking pot in the woods and I'm like, "What? This is." all I'm doing is screaming at these kids that don't even want to run. And so pretty quickly, I realized that like, actually, maybe this is what I want to do with my life. Yeah. And so I, whatever, I committed to do this. So I did that for, for a year and then moved back to DC and started working again at the company that, that, um, that we had started. And at that point it was transforming into a different, totally different vision. And so I did that for a couple of years, uh, decided I want to go back to business school and start working at Merrill Lynch before that, just to kind of get some experience in finance, loved what I was doing there and said, you like know, investment banking. Uh, and that's where I wanted to, that's what I wanted to get into. I was just working for a, um, you know, financial consultant. Yeah. And so More like but I got a advisory. flavor for it that I thought this is, this is fun and interesting. And you know, so I either want to be, yeah, investment banker or analyst were the two things I yeah. thought might be interesting to do. And so um, anyways, it's sort of, you know, first year of business school, it's all kind of finance, you know, you totally. know cost accounting, accounting, you know, operations, uh, finance. So um, that was, you know, kind of on track with what I wanted to do. And then in between my first and second year of business school, moved to London, worked at Merrill Lynch, and it was, um, and then was taking classes at Oxford. And that was the first marketing class I'd ever taken and fell in love with that and said, never mind, need to get into marketing. So second year focused on that, graduated in 01, which was, you know, the economy was a disaster. Wanted yeah. to work at Nike, uh, only place at Nike. They were actually letting a lot of people go, but Nike Golf was just starting up. So they had like 12 employees, that was the only, you know, part of Nike that was hiring. And I met with this woman who was heading it up and she's like, well, that's terrific, but you've never had a marketing job. So why don't you do that first and then come back and apply. And so that's how I got into the family business. I called my dad and said, Hey, listen, I can never be passionate about muffins and pancakes. So, but I do need some marketing experience. Do you have any junior roles open? And, and I said, you know, I'm, on, I'm here for two years. That's it. And then I'm going to move down to Oregon, work at Nike. And so 20 years later, I'm still at Cotton Mills and kind of <laughs> learn that, you know, it's for me at least less about the actual product category. And it's more about like, do you, you are you really proud of the products that you're selling and do you like the people you're working with? And, and yeah, I've been really blessed. It's and, so, it's so interesting. Cause you think about these like sliding door stories, right? Have you seen that movie with Gwyneth Paltrow? Like just, no. if you make, if you take a left, it's that you got to watch it. You write it down to watch it. It's, it's, 
it's just about how you make choices in life. And like the outcome is just so crazy different. I also wanted to work at Nike. I wanted to be an Egan. Do you remember that program? It's no. Nike. It's Nike spelled backwards. And you basically go around the country. It's like the coolest ass job um, and sell Nike products to, oh, wow. I, I got to look it up and see if it's still even in existence. But I had an obsession with Nike because I was also a division one college athlete and Nike was like the company. I still yeah. is. I love Nike. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. And, but yeah, it didn't happen. And then it's like, here I am. And all the things that have happened in my life would never have happened if I had moved to Oregon. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Crazy. So you started there thinking it's going to be a couple of years. Was it um, extra pressure to kind of make sure that you were, um, you know, working extra hard since you were the boss's son? Um, yes and no, I guess. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I think I just was incra- ingrained in me at that, at that point, you know, through athletics and everything else that, you know, to, to work hard. Um, yeah. And so I think I've always had a pretty good work ethic. Um, but yeah, I was very conscious of, you know, not ever wanting to be perceived as, as doing anything, you know, less than working my ass off. And so, right. yeah, so, yeah, so the, the, yeah, I guess the answer is yes. And then, um, and then, you know, I just jumped around to a bunch of different roles. And yeah, so, you've had so many, I mean, sales, marketing, ops, like everything, but um, I want to get into all that. But first, for people who don't understand, you know, the history of the company, it's such a cool story. Um, I guess, tell me some of the origin story of the company. Yeah, so the origin story is actually super, super cool. So yeah, I love it. This Rose Charters, like I, I was researching, I'm like, this is so cool. Yeah, yeah. So this like badass woman um, started a food manufacturing company in the depths of the great depression in 1932, when, you know, it was probably atypical for a woman to start a business, let alone manufacturing business on South Jackson Avenue, by the way, was the first manufacturing facility. And, um, and so anyways, yeah, so she, she started up not a family member. um, And how my family got involved was my grandfather's uncle, who was there was a different term for it, but it's basically an investment bank had invested in the company and he didn't know anybody. He he was out of Chicago. He didn't know anybody in the Seattle area other than my grandfather that he kind of knew and trusted. And he asked him to be on the board and eventually Rose wanted him to kind of step into the president CEO role. Couldn't really pay him much. So she just gave him equity. And so that's how my family ended up kind of getting involved and having equity in the business. Uh, When my father took over the business was losing money um, on the verge of bankruptcy and so he ended up um, uh, through government bonds ended up uh, buying out all the other equity owners and so it was yeah. it's it was ended up at that point being like something like 98 uh, percent owned within within my family and then he was ceo for i think 45 years incredible and uh yeah, did, so, did he and did he and his dad have a good working relationship? Like these these family businesses are always so fascinating. And as you know, we had a an implosion of a family business story. And I always think it's it's compl- it's much more complicated. Oh yeah, yep for sure. Um, yeah, no, but they I think they had a pretty good working relationship. There was a time that my dad had shared with me where he was going to leave the company and he was just not getting along with his his father and and it got to the point where finally his dad you know, brought him into the office and said, Hey, listen, I think you either need to run this thing or you're going to leave. And he said, yep. And so, uh, my grandfather stepped aside and would still come into the office every day and he kind of opened the mail and, yeah. and, and all that. But um, and we all know those stories, right? Yeah. Check the yeah. mail, make his, make his rounds. Yeah. Yeah. But it sounds like he was really, really good. And it's, I think this is really challenging for people to do that have been running a business for a long time to truly get out of the way. And, yeah, yeah, I think it's like even more challenging when it's your son, right? And yeah. you know all their flaws, and you know oh, you're yeah. used to telling what to do, and and so that's um, for sure one of the things my dad always talked about my grandfather, and just being really appreciative is when he yeah. chose to step aside, he truly gave my dad total autonomy to to run the business. That's amazing. We I, we'll talk offline. We have a similar story, but it didn't happen that way. My grandfather didn't didn't move aside. Yeah. Um, and get out of the way. So that's, that is amazing. And so I did read like in around 1962, that a lot of the company was um, supporting military troops. Yeah. 
And also that like the idea was basically to just be able to have a product where you can just add water. Like you don't yeah. even think about this concept now. Yeah. And it's such an easy product. Yeah. And also so helpful for people that don't have a ton of money that you can just, all you need is water and you're, you're surviving. Like, yeah. 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 I mean, especially during the depression and all that. And, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy to think now, but that was like a, that was like a, you know, innovation breakthrough that was all about convenience is to be able to make a pie crust mix, but just add water. And obviously people were making a lot more pies back then. And that was, that was the first product. That's why the name is crusties. I don't know why it's misspelled with a K and a Z, but, um, and backwards. Yeah, I mentioned it's, you're like, it's like a, it's like a last name that you're like, ah, oh, here we go again. I got to spell it. Yeah. 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 And people always, always mispronounce it. So yeah, I How think do, what we, do they we had say? a do over, we might, uh, crust, crust Oh yeah. I is, can see is, that. Well, I mean, I've known, I've known the name for so long that I'm like, wait, it's Krusty's. Like, of course. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people think it's like a German brand. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. So, yeah, I think if we had a do-over, we might come up with a different name. But anyways, that, that's the name yeah. that, that, And so, uh, the, so the business yeah. or origin story is, um, yeah, so your dad brought it out. And it was like, basically, what was the company producing at that time? Like, uh, pie crust and, and yeah, pie crust. Well, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, you know, again, uh, uh, Rose started with just a, just add water, uh, pie crust mix. That was the first of its kind. And then she started the first ever just add water pancake mix as well, which was developed at the university of Washington. So those were kind of the two flagship products early on. My dad's kind of claim to fame, which I think is, you know, what, what gave my grandfather confidence that he could run the business. Cause my, my, father was a disaster growing up, got kicked out of Blanchett. He was just, a you know, there was, there, there weren't a lot of indicators that he was going to be a wildly successful business person. Um, and so, but he, he did but very, talk about fun. I mean, sometimes I'm like, those are the people that you want around, right? Yes. And, and there's, and it's like, I always tell the kids, I'm like, you're good with people. You know how to talk, you know how to like maneuver through life. You got the street smarts to me. That's huge. And that was your dad. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't seen very many companies, fail because they weren't smart enough right it's it's they right. didn't have passion they weren't aligned they didn't have a great team they weren't you know they didn't attract the right people and right. so right and those people want to like you know they want to throw themselves in front of a bus for you that's a terrible saying but like the yeah. loyalty and the commitment and the tenure of your people that says something yeah yep yeah. my yeah and my my dad was a total fun hog and uh it just you know was 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 is just a great person was a great person um but uh, yeah, so his kind of claim to fame before we started running the business was he got the deal for the Great Alaska Pipeline. And so he beat out the Pillsbury Company, which was the dominant supplier at the time of all baked mix products. And I won't say he lied, but he definitely exaggerated what we could do to get that business. So um, we didn't do muffins or brownies or biscuits. And he said, oh, no, we can do all that stuff. And we didn't have any formulas or anything else and won the bid. And so then we quickly had to sort of expand our portfolio to a full line of kind of all flour based mixes really rapidly to to get that business. And that, I think, tripled the size of the business at the time. Um, yeah. There's something like 40,000 people working on the pipeline. And the one thing is hard work, but the one thing they gave people was just there was the food hall was open, you know, 24 seven, you could get up in the middle of the night and have a steak. You could have, you know, brown, whatever you wanted. It was carte blanche. And so, and so it was a huge business at the time for them and expanded the portfolio. And that's really was the trigger for sort of enabling us to get into all these other categories in food service and in, in CPG. But at the time we were still pretty much a food service regional business and a, and a CPG regional business. I mean, until, Really, just before I started 20 years ago, we were still pretty much a West Coast company, um, yeah. and heavily concentrated in, in the Northwest with some distribution down in California and some distributors took us elsewhere, but we didn't have sort of any, you know, salespeople out East or anything else, you know, driving the business. Right. And I think that, you know, your dad being able to kind of fake it till he makes it and sell is an incredible quality, but then he had to operationalize it and execute and hire people and figure out the manufacturing and figure out the formulas. Like that's not nothing. That's incredible. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's funny. You look at some of the old pictures back then and you know, it's just unbelievable what they were able to pull off with the assets. They yeah. had the, just very little automation. And um, you know, I remember when I first, like when I was when I'd work at summer jobs, at the manufacturing plant, like you didn't work hard enough if you had all 10 digits, like, <laughs> Like, I mean, it's terrible. We'd never stand for that today. Back then right. it was, 
I mean, that was just the nature of the work. How did that um, bid and winning that bid impact like the profitability of the business? Because you had to front load so much money into manufacturing and, and, and then the pay, the pay terms of that bid, like yeah. how did he get ahead of it to make sure that the company was continuing to be profitable? Well, yeah, I think, again, the business was, I think, really, really, really struggling at the time. And I think that's what really pushed it into profitability and the timing of the bid to the investing in assets and hiring people and what that transition looked like. I'm not sure how long it, it took them to become profitable, but I think that was, again, kind of the thing that opened my grandfather's eyes and said, oh, wait, this this kid yeah, might actually like, Holy shit, look at him. It. He's yeah. rocking and rolling. And so tell me, so that was around the time, like, and then when you joined, um, I guess you've learning the business from every aspect and like how every, how the sausage is made, as they say, like how, how it all works. Um, where were you the most successful? Was it sales, marketing, ops, kind of, where did you feel the most like I'm in my lane? Um, pro- yeah, sales is something that, that's, I've always really enjoyed. And I think I have done a good job in, my, in the sales roles I've been in. Uh, innovation is probably the thing that gets me up in the morning and, 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 and so um, that's another area that that I probably spend a disproportionate amount of my time on. And and so, yeah, so I initially was in marketing and then in sales roles and then ended up at one point, actually two different points in my career running sales, marketing and R&D. And so that was cool and fun because I had total total sort, sort of scope of responsibility for the entire growth the, side the, of our business. Yeah, the products, yeah. Yeah, and so sort of was able to head up innovation and kind of, see it all the way from concept commercialization to actually going out in the market and talking to customers to, you know, yeah. try to actually gain distribution. So and how, how much of your time at home is spent kind of talking to the kids about it? Like you come home and be like, Hey guys, I got this incredible idea. Or are they like, yeah, yeah, whatever, dad, just give me a muffin. And like, yeah. What's uh, their engagement level? They, I think they're kind of interested in the branding and marketing side too. I mean, I think a lot of people are right. It's just you know, it's a tangible it's the cool part, yeah. stuff you see in the market, and so um, yeah, their, their eyes will roll over pretty quick when I start talking about you know trying to hedge our, our commodities or something like that, but um, or a new you know Cartner asset that we're putting into Hopkinsville or something. <laughs> but yeah, if I like, talk whatever, about Dad. hey, we're coming out with this frozen red lobster biscuit, they're like, oh, that's cool. Can I see a picture? And yeah. there's a packaging look. When can I try a sample? And then. You know, our, a lot of our products just, you know, are really weighted towards the, the demographic is basically moms with kids. And so, uh, and it's really, you know, trying to, you know, create something that they can be proud of to serve to their kids and have that connectivity with their family. And so it's inherently, you know, yeah. products that kids love, brownies, well, cookies. We, we've got a ton of products and we've got our whole pantry is all Continental Mills products. So oh, tell good. tell the listeners what some of the brands are that, that you, um, that, that fall under Continental Mills and um, that we would recognize. So Krusty's is, is our flagship brand. Again, kind of the origins of the company uh, represents about a third of our total revenue. Um, so that, that continues to be kind of our primary focus. Uh, we have licensing relationships with Ghirardelli. And so any product you buy, that's a baked mix product with the Ghirardelli brand. We've I love that. I love those uh, brownies. The yes. Ghirardelli brownies are yes, so, are those crack. are dangerous. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that's uh. So we've got twenty five year relationship with with Ghirardelli, and we're about to re up for another ten years with them. And so it's 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 their brand. We treat it like it's our brand. We have an exclusivity within any categories that we compete in. So it sort of really feels like our brand within yeah. um, in the categories that we participate. Um, we have the same type of relationship with Red Lobster or Red Lobster Biscuits, which aren't a big thing in Seattle, but they're- Yeah, I read that and was like, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, it's unbelievable. So yeah, the story of <laughs> Red Lobster came to us. They, Sam's Club had done a deal with Darden, who was the you know restaurant company that owned Red Lobster at the time. And they had done a uh, Red, they'd done a Olive Garden salad dressing at Sam's and just did extremely well. So they went back to Darden and said, do you have another kind of iconic product that you think would do well in CPG? And, and they were sort of lukewarm on this idea of having CPG products. So they thought it might be cannibalistic to their restaurants. And so they were kind of half in and they said, yeah, it's, it's this red lobster biscuit. So Sam's club called us and said, Hey, we want you guys to do this. And we were at the time supplying about 10% of the biscuit mix to red lobster in their actual stores or restaurants. And so we didn't want to do it. Uh, but we had Sam's club pressuring us and we had, 
Darden, who was another big customer of ours. And so we said, okay. And I will say, I was on the record saying, this is a really stupid idea. This is, this is not going to sell well. Cause I, right. I, had been to a, I don't think I'd been to a red lobster at the time. Right. And you know, there aren't you're just like, Hey Seattle. guys, we're going to red lobster. I feel like that's like a thing. Yeah. Yeah. It is a bit, I mean, it's a really, and it ain't cheap. Uh, red right. lobster. So it's a, it's, it's a big deal. It's a lot of people's like their first big date. Yeah. We're red going lobster. to red lobster tonight. Yeah. yeah like, just, it's I don't a, know there's like, a Beyonce song about red lobster. Maybe. And, yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and so what do they say? A, a, a good idea has a thousand fathers, a bad idea is an orphan. And so um, I could tell you, everybody thought it was a bad idea. And then after it did really well, everyone thought, oh, that was my idea. That was my idea. Yeah, exactly. I could, I could I'll take, I'll take credit for that. Bad. Yeah. So we sold to Sam's and we sold like two pallets per location. And like two days later, they called us and said, we have no inventory. And people were, we're selling sold these out. Yeah. for 50 bucks on eBay. And so then everyone's like, oh, this is a great idea. <laughs> and so anyways, today it's the, it's the top selling item in almost every retailer in the bake category is this red Oh, that's fascinating. Made. Yeah. So I don't know why it just, I, I have a like response that's like, eh, but I'm now I want to try it. You got to try it. It's now it, I gotta try it, it, it is truly uh crack. It's amazing. Well, I We mean, have this Naquami Falls Lodge uh, pancake mix also. And we have, I mean, yeah. we have to have them all. And until I researched you for the podcast, I didn't realize that a lot of them were falling under continental mills. Yeah. So can you just tell me, cause I should know this, but I don't really understand the difference between like brands that that you own and that are like, um, I guess, originating with Continental Mills and the licensing deals. Like why, what's in it for those companies to do licensing deals? Well, so for Ghirardelli, they get kind of two sources of revenue. One is they get the licensing fee. So we pay a a percentage of our, every dollar we sell goes back to them. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, goes directly to their bottom line. So, I mean, that's, that's how most licensing deals are structured, but for them, we also buy their chocolate. And, so and, and they I, need you because you have the ability to manufacture more and faster. Is that yeah, yeah, right? And, okay. and we know the category really well, and and you've got the relationships with all the, the retailers. Yeah, I mean, we do. We kind of. I mean, we've got the full kind of slate of capabilities. So everything from you know procurement in in commodity management to supply chain in and outbound logistics yeah. to manufacturing capability to R and D capability relationships with customers in the in the bake mix category so um you know penetration in every relevant channel so yeah so are they coming to you do Um, they do these companies come to you and seek you out or are you trying to get more of this business and and doing outreach there no i think we i'm not really interested in, in starting any more licensing relationships not to say we wouldn't but um we really kind of would prefer to sort of manage our own brands to the extent it makes, makes a lot of sense. But I think originally yeah. they came to us. It was, you know, privately held business at the time. It's now owned by Lint, Ghirardelli is. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. And so, uh, so that's kind of, it started, you know, get 25 years ago. And I think our COO at the time had a relationship with the CEO of Ghirardelli and it started off as one product that we sold to Costco. And, and now it's a hundred million dollar business, uh, uh, Ghirardelli bake mix products. That's insane. Um, and then the other licensing relationship, it, it started, um, you know, it, it kind of shared that story already. Yeah. So those are our only two licensing relationships. Um, so yeah, so it's, you know, crusties, um, and then we have a snack business, that we acquired about 11 years ago called Wild Roots. And it's, um, it's I think the num- it's a, it's a number one consumed trail mix in the United States. Um, and it's only sold at Costco and Sam's. Okay, and so I'm today, writing it down because I probably have it in my pantry and don't even realize I have it. Yeah, it's, 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 the, it's amazing. It's a great, great, great trail mix. The trail mix is kind of a commoditized category, but this is, this is a different deal. It's, so this is, this is <laughs> delicious. Costco, okay. Yeah, so we bought that like, uh, yeah, like, I don't know, I think it was 11 or 12 years ago or something. And, and that's been this big growth opportunity for us. We've, we were finally, finally, finally taking that brand outside of just Costco and Sam's. And so we're testing it at two retailers right now. And it's doing really well. So we're kind of doing a proof of concept that it can survive and thrive outside of the club channel. And so that hopefully is a vehicle for sort of incremental and, and hopefully some significant growth beyond kind of the flower-based business that that's our core business. Right. So you talked about commodities a little bit. I mean, obviously supply chain and just everything has just get gotten turned on its head um, in these past couple of years. How has that impacted the business? I know your business is up, 
overall revenue wise, but how's the back end working for you? Oh, it's just so, so challenging. Um, everything from obviously with, you know, COVID and just people like physically being out because they right. had it or were exposed to it. At one time, we had like 40% of our Hopkinsville facility that was out, not necessarily because they had it, but they'd been exposed to somebody that right. had it. Um, yeah. In the manufacturing plants and just different areas. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, obviously they they don't have the luxury of of working remotely. Yeah. And so, right. And that's where two thirds of our of our employees work is in our manufacturing. Yeah. How many yeah. total employees do you have? Uh, about eight hundred. Yeah. So the two thirds of those are in these plants, and so that obviously slows things down. Yeah. Uh, when they're out, and and what about getting the actual product? Yeah. So, um, you know, we most of our our products are sourced domestically. And so we didn't have some of these nightmare supply chain challenges that, you know, a lot of companies have had. Um, but what really has happened over the last six months is just, it's not that we, the materials or sometimes the, the manufacturing assets, a uh, partner or whatever it might be, isn't available. It's just the lead times have like quadrupled. And so mm. kind of any sort of instantaneous capacity is not instantaneous anymore. Yeah. And so it, it just supply chain disruption, material availability has been super, super delayed. Uh, people out with COVID, uh, just m- more challenging to recruit than ever before. Our retention levels have actually been relatively good. I mean, high, you know, higher turnover than we're used to, but usually, you know, short term employees that, you know, came in and then and then left. So recruiting retention, the existing employee base, you know, being out with COVID, uh, you know, packaging and ingredient availability being slow. Um, and then, um, just, and then just inflation is yeah. you know, it's, oh, it's it's going crazy already before this yeah. whole Ukraine right, the thing. Russia, I mean, yeah. like steroids now. Yeah. But, and, and it, do you, Andy, have to be the one to kind of talk to your, your customers, like calling Costco, like, Hey, sorry, we can't get you and how under I'm sure Costco has been great. We had Richard Galanti on the CFO yeah. on the podcast who's awesome, yeah. but yeah. like how understanding have these companies been that you partner with and how has that impacted, I guess, relationships? Cause it's become so human yeah. and like seeing how people deal is like you see them through the bad times and you learn a lot about people. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it was super interesting on the front end of COVID as we were having to take price increases and everybody else was, and we led in our category, which normally we try to follow <laughs> the strength in, in numbers. And particularly if you're not tip of the spear uh, announcing a price increase, but we were the first to announce a price increase. And it was the first time that I'd seen customers act completely irrationally and, you know, and saying, well, we're, we're not going to accept this. We're going to kick you out. We're going to eliminate your entire brand from, you know, customer X, Y, or Z. And, and we're looking at them saying, well, like most of our buyers are also the buyers of flour and sugar in the commodities. Right. And like, so wait, are you, if you guys have better contracts, can we draw off? Your right. Contracts? You're like, and how are you, how are you planning on getting this then? Yeah. And yeah. so eventually they accepted the price increases and now we're in the process of announcing another price increase. And I think most buyers have just their kind of give or shitter has broken and like, okay, I'm, t- I'm done fighting this. Like, like just, okay, whatever, what is it? You know? Yeah. And so it's just interesting, you know, a year ago, our price increase was, you know, fought tooth and nail. And this time, I think these buyers recognize that, you know, they're not going to have suppliers. if They don't take their price increases. because. And it's changed and people just have to be nimble. They have to be flexible. And then just the human side. It's like, really? We've had this long-term relationship and you're going to act like this? Yeah, yeah. You know? And I, you, you said you brought up Costco. Costco is was awesome. And they're, they're super classy. Awesome. I mean, they're not going to yeah. let you get away with anything that isn't justified and they're smart, you know? And so they want to look at your ingredient decks. They want to understand your contracts. They want to understand how covered you are on any given commodity. And so they'll go into the weeds to really understand. But if if ultimately the price increase is justified, um, they're, they're, they're going to support it. They, they yeah. want their vendors to be successful. And that's been the nature. A lot of people say Costco is so tough. I mean, they yeah. are tough, but they're also they're tough. I'm but once you're in, to be fair. yeah, yeah I've, heard, I've heard that from so many people who supply products yeah. to them. Um, and it makes me more loyal to them because I know that their products have been vetted so much. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm like, oh, well, this, this has clearly been through the ringer. If they're going to be carrying it, the quality yeah. is going to be there. Um, yeah. How would you describe the company culture? Um, 
You know, it's, it's going to sound like all the th things that everybody else says, you know, we, we care okay. deeply about our employees. Um, and I think maybe even more, or at least equally as important as, you know, me and my leadership team and the executive team and the, and the VPs and the directors caring about their employees, like the employees care about each other and they really have each other's backs. And I think part of that is a function of just our origins, you know, being a, you know, being a family owned business, being sort of really sort of, you know, having a small scope of focus around what geography we were looking at. And so kind of everybody was from the same area. Mm -hmm. Our corporate offices were integrated into our manufacturing facilities. So there was a lot of overlap. The fact that our, you know, our salespeople were only selling in the Northwest meant that they actually had cubicles or office space, like in our, in our manufacturing area. So like our, the person who's selling it is then coming in saying, okay, hey, can somebody actually make this? <laughs> right. Oh, hey, line operator, do you think you could actually yeah. make, make this thing? And so, yeah. And then, and then also just the, the tenure, you know, particularly at our Kent plant is, is probably closer to like 15 or 16 years. And so there's That's amazing fathers that work with their sons, there's wives that work with their husbands, there's cousins. And so, and so there's this like sort of not only this like kind of paternalistic, Hey, we care about you as the leaders of the organization, but there's this like, you know, we care about each other. We have each other's yeah. back, and that's sort of permeated the culture of the organization. So our Hopkinsville, Kentucky facility has that same culture that we have out in Kent, because I think that was sort of the expectation. Yeah, well, that says a lot about the company that people are recommending their loved ones, right? It's like yeah. this is such a cool company. You got to come work here. And I am curious because when I think about baking anything, it's a warm fuzzy feeling. And so yeah. it's like probably you're there's there's probably a thread throughout of like the types of people who are successful there are, are warm and they're interested yeah. in like what you're actually doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so are there kind of, aside from being caring, are there attributes that you see um, as far as like who would be successful there on the corporate side, not necessarily manufacturing and the plants, but like the leadership team, are there skill sets that you're like, this, is, this makes a good Continental Mills employee? Yeah. I mean, I think it almost goes back to kind of what we talked about earlier, like like, you know, sure. Like, you know, if we're hiring someone in marketing, we want them to have, you know, some, you know, if, it, if it's a, you know, unless it's a just absolute entry level employee, you know, we'd like for them to have some marketing experience and some brand management experience and some consumer insights experience. And so there's the tangible side of it for sure that we're looking at just like everybody else. But it, at the end of the day, it's really like, you know, is this person a good cultural fit? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about earlier, like it's, you know, it's, 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 we want smart people, but that's that's not the top thing on the list. It's like, is this going to be a go good cultural fit? Is this someone that 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 you know is it, you know thinks holistically, thinks um, about the the welfare of the the total organization? Um, uh, you know, someone that is is curious, wants to grow. Somebody that you know, we say you know, we're not expecting this of you, and we're not going to you know be mad at you if this doesn't end up being your career. But we want you to retire here. Yeah. And so that's kind of the mindset is we want someone to fully kind of buy in to this company and, and, you know, buy into, into our culture. Yeah. Um, well, and some of the other things that I think you probably feel pretty good about, which also I'm sure permeates into the culture, the ways that the company gives back. Yeah. Um, how is that uh, thought through? Are you, is it coming from the top down or some of your employees saying, Hey, these are way, these are important organizations for us to support. Um, a little bit of both. Um, at the corporate level, I'd say it's more top down, and you know, with engagement from lots of people, and and if anything, we pr probably a little bit err on the side of being overly inclusive in terms of almost anything that we do, um, because we you know ideally want as many people as possible to have feel a sense of ownership of of what we're what we're doing as an organization. And so initially, really kind of our philanthropic strategy was all oriented around kind of food based. Uh, nonprofits. And the, the thought there is that, you know, anyone can cut a check, but we can have a disproportionate impact on all things food, right? Just because we can donate products, we can provide expertise, we can, uh, you know, so help with supply chain issues. And so Fair Start, uh, Food Lifeline, uh, Union Gospel Mission, were sort of our three pillar partners, and they still are. Um, the, the sort of new thing for us is Boys and Girls Club is, is, probably going to evolve to be our most strategic uh, partner. And, and that was really kind of actually born out of a lot of this DEI stuff that, that happened and the social movements that were taking place. And, 
you know, frankly, I, I wish we had a more diverse leadership team than we do. And we have a, a process in our recruiting, um, in our recruiting process where we want to make sure we have a really diverse interview team. And it's a very thorough process that people go through. Um, it's a little bit of a gauntlet. Um, yeah. But ultimately, we want to make sure that we're bringing in diverse candidates. But the reality is we don't have um, as diverse a talent pool to draw from as I wish we yeah. did. Are you guys yeah. remote first or are you back in the office or how's that? Because that, are... that may have an impact on your strategy. Well, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we've been for a long time, just voluntary. If you want to come to the office, you can. And mm -hmm. so we're planning on having a permanent solution that we're going to announce pretty quickly here that we haven't quite landed on in June that will probably be something in between, you know, how we used to do business and, and right now where it's, you know, work wherever you, you want. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting because like um, before we started recording, you were talking about your buddy at Nike and how they have all these things to try to draw people in at the end of the day it's so hard right now because so many companies are either fully remote or remote first with like optionality. And um, as we, you know, I've been recruiting for 28 years and I've always thought about diversity, but obviously put much more intention around it in the last couple of years. And it's great that you're thinking like that. But when I'm talking to leaders, I am saying like, if you're remote first, you can draw from all sorts of different communities and cities, which may have a more diverse population. Yep more yeah. representative of the direction you're trying to take the company. Yeah, um, for sure. So, yeah. For the first yeah. time we're, we're filling some roles without requirement to live in Seattle. That in the yeah. Past it's an so adjustment. We're, we're doing the same thing. It's an adjustment for sure. But um, you know, look at your numbers, look at your growth, it's working. And yeah. so it's kind of like stick with it and it's got it. We got to be nimble and move with the times. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, you talked about like the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning is this kind of innovation and product. What's, um, What's the newer products that are coming out, or can you not tell us? Oh no, I, I can I can share. So yeah, no, I think the thing I'm I'm really excited about is, is on our core business. So we've been we're, we're coming up on our 90th year um, in business. We started the company was called Crusties initially, it wasn't Continental Mills, and and yet we've never invested in any meaningful way in the Crusties brand, and so we. To kind of put it in perspective, in 2017, I think we spent $1.2 million on you know social and digital. Um, this year, we'll spend about $15 million. Oh, and my so, gosh. Yeah, so we've been kind of gradually ticking it up. But we want to get to the point where we're spending north of $20 million on a consistent basis, which is, is sort of an almost always on a national reach uh, threshold, is mm -hmm. kind of what we're told through our agencies. So so that's our goal. And so just, just the sort of growth we can gain through sort of household penetration and distribution on our core business is there's tons of upside. And so where you might see at Fred Meyer or QFC or any kind of these Northwest retailers, you might see six Krusty's muffins and two Betty Crockers. You go to Publix and in, 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 you know, in Florida and you're going to see the opposite. You're going to see six. So just the distribution gains that we can sort of accumulate without adding a single new grocery store, just have getting more of our SKUs on shelf. Um, is, is And I think we have a really compelling story to tell as a family in our business. But you're saying more SKUs on the shelf coming through the consumers, making those demands on the grocery stores, like, hey, we want yeah. Krusty's. Is yeah, that, is really that just, the strategy? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, we'd love for them to go, you know, to the grocery store and say, hey, why aren't you carrying XYZ? That that actually helps with some, believe it or not. They actually listen sometimes. But uh, the more just, you know, voting with their dollars. And so the, the more velocities, the higher we're selling relative to our competitors, yeah. And the more loyal consumers are because they have an emotional connection with the brand, um, that's just a lot more insulating and it, and it drives velocities and, and market share. And ultimately, that's how retailers are deciding what they want on shelf and what they don't want on shelf. And so we've never made that investment. So on our core business, that's probably our, our biggest opportunity. We're looking at um, some other innovations in our, in our kind of core space. Um, but maybe what might be as exciting as that to anybody at Continental Mills is we're getting into totally kind of large and incremental spaces. So we're just launching a frozen red lobster biscuit. And so we're getting into the frozen space, which is a much bigger category than the mm. big mix category. And so for our first, you know, you know, entry into that category is this frozen red lobster biscuit. We just started shipping uh, to Walmart. It's already the number one selling item of its kind at Walmart. Um, we can't keep up with their demand and we're just starting to sell it to other customers as well. And so that will give us, and, we're, and we brought 
in that manufacturing capability in-house in our Effingham, Illinois facility. And so that gives us just sort of a whole new capability to grow within Frozen that, that we can leverage, you know, our owned and licensed brands. And so that's super exciting. We are getting into the refrigerated space right now, just in food service with this like patent pending technology that's a batter that is refrigerated that you just put in a pan, squirt it from a you know, pouch into a pan, throw it in the oven, bake it, and it tastes as good as a Krusty's muffin or a Ghirardelli brownie or anything else. Oh, I'm so excited. And so these will be all under the Krusty's brand. Yeah, Krusty's, but potentially, you know, Ghirardelli and, and Wild Roots as well. And so th- those are, again, big categories, totally incremental to what we're doing today. And then the yeah. other is, is, is snack. And so snack, again, we've only been selling to Costco and Sam's, our Wild Roots brand. We have a Buck Wild brand as well, which is more of a snack mix brand. And so we're just testing that outside of the club channel. And, you know, the snack is a massive and rapidly growing category. So that's another space where there's tons of incrementality for us as we kind of look you know, and we have the luxuries of privately family owned business to think kind of in generations, not quarters or fiscal years. Yeah. And so as we look out and I don't know if my kids will ever work at Continental Mills, but that's sort of how I'm thinking about it. What if the kids don't want to get into the business? What, what do you do? It's like, you have to have them do it. You have to have them keep going. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. You know, it's or maybe Pat's son will do it. I mean, who yeah, knows? It could be, or I got, I got, yeah, cousins who have kids. And, and so yeah, I don't, you know, I, but the reality is, again, my, you know, until 20 years ago, there was no plan to have me involved in the business and right. my dad was still energized and working hard. And, um, and, you know, the, you, one of the really unique things about Continental Mills is, as a, you know, third generation family business, really a fourth generation business is I'm the only family member that's involved in a kind of operational role. So I've got family members on the board who are awesome. And, but it, it's pretty unique to be, third generation family business that only has one family member yeah working. well I think that it's probably makes it a little bit easier as far as like family dinners like it doesn't have to be the dynamic of like oh my gosh this is all we're going to talk about let's For talk sure. let's talk about like you know trips and kids and yeah. politics and life uh, yeah absolutely I mean, I've seen some family businesses do it really really well um and I've got you know my my cousins and my brother are all smarter than me so and they're all great people and so I'd love to work with them um on their side of the coin I've seen, I feel like I've seen more family businesses, which with all the right intent, you know, they kept it in the family. They encourage everyone to work there as a way to sort of bring people together. But it over time can the be opposite, more of a yeah. source of agitation than it is. And for all of the natural, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, people, so my dad and I had such a great working relationship. A lot of people ask like, how do you guys do it? Why does it work so well? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm not a great source of information there because I have, I don't, I'm not facing some of the challenges that a lot of other family businesses are, but one perspective that I feel really strong about is, and it's amazing to me how many family businesses don't do this, is sit down and just ask this very simple question, what role do you want this business to serve in your life? And if the answer is different from one generation to the next, and, and it should be different in theory, right? Typically, if you're older, you want a stable business, you want to be able to count on your dividends, you want to manage it conservatively. And if you're young, you, you know, hey, let's take a ton of risk and I want to grow this thing like crazy. Both answers can be right, but they're generally different. And that ends up by definition, if you want different things out of the business, it's going to be a source of irritation, not something that brings you together. And I was super fortunate in that my dad, he's saying is always the difference between an old person and a young person is an old person uh, thinks about the past, a young person thinks about the future. And so I'll never be old. And so he was always all about redeploying our earnings back into the business and growing it and, you know, dividends be damned. Let's, let's grow this business. And, and so he operated like a young person. And, and so anyway, so it was this wonderful relationship that he and I had for our entire working uh, relationship, but that's, that's so unusual, right? And, yeah. I love that you remember all these quotes. I can't remember one. I can't remember one joke. I just thought my brain is like shut down in that way. <laughs> you probably yeah. have a lot more. I love that. I love when, um, people pass on like quotes and just like the ways to think about life. Yeah, he was um, a good bumper sticker guy. He had a lot of a lot of quotes that just he was great at kind of summarizing an issue and decomplexifying it with a. Is there statement. is there a quote for you that you kind of live by or that you reference? Uh, this- my favorite quote from my dad, and it was usually when he was trying to convince you to have one more drink with him. He'd say, "Come on, one and done, one and done, one and done." I'm, hey, Dad, I really got, I got to get back. 
if I said if you said no to that, his his answer was like, "Hey, you know what? You're dead a long time." So that, that that was that's my favorite quote from my dad because you could get somebody to do just about anything with that one. Yeah, you're dead oh. a long time. Come on, have some fun. I love that. That is, I'm going to write that down. I love that one. And so, curious, your work sounds like you're working your tail off. How are you balancing your life? Like, what do you do to relax and unwind? Um. You know, my brother would say I don't have much of a life, but because uh, it's it's work and family for the for the most part. Um, we we ended up getting a place in Sun Valley four or five years ago. So um, you know, and with COVID, that was awesome because you know working completely remotely. And if there was a you know hour and a half break, I'd go jump on the slopes for an hour. So that was really cool. But but that's sort of come and gone. <laughs> um, so no, I mean it's it that you know, and, and maybe this is even kind of seems like a theme of, you know, what you're, what you're, you know, talk to people about, but if you, if you don't love what you're doing, life's hard. Right. And so I actually really love what I do and I love the people I work with. And so, you know, work to me is kind of like, well, yeah, I do a lot of it, but I played a lot of basketball when I was in junior high. It wasn't work. I loved it. I love my teammates. I love the competition. I love the, the whole thing. And so, I spend a lot of time working, but I actually really enjoy it. And so it's really just, you know, I think for me, it's trying to find that right balance between, you know, family and work and trying to carve out a little bit of time for, you know, you know, spending time with with friends, which is, you know, probably the, the thing I shortcut the most. Yeah. Well, I'm sure everybody wants a little piece of you. So you're getting spread too thin. You got to prioritize in some way. So my final question for you is what fuels you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think probably what again kind of gets me up in the morning and excited is 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 sort of the marketplace facing stuff. So innovation and the things we're doing finally and in investing in our brands is is super exciting. If I kind of pan out and think more, I guess, big picture, you know, what would I look back and say, hey, I, I lived a fulfilling, you know, work and personal life you know, if I'm 70 years old and I'm retiring or whatever, I think I'd want to, I think first and and foremost, just feel like, hey, we we are really proud of the products we created and we're really proud of how we treated our employees in, in, in all aspects. So in terms of, you know, we want to make sure we're paying fairly, but we over-index on healthcare because, you know, yeah. if we're not taking care of our employees from a health and wellness standpoint, then what are we doing? And then I think the other area we kind of maybe over index on is, is really setting people up to retire well. And I think for me, that's important because, you know, it'd be important anyways, but particularly at Continental Mills where they, where the tenure is so high, I mean, people are dedicating their, their lives. And, you know, as we talked about earlier, like the majority of your non-sleeping life is spent at work. And so, people are really dedicating their lives to this company. And if they don't retire well, if we don't do everything in our power to set them up to retire well, then what the hell did we, did we do? So yeah, those I love the, that. If, if we're, I mean, I want to kick General Mills' ass and I want to, you know, have all sorts of su- success in the marketplace. But if I look back and I failed at that, you know, I, I, I would be disappointed. But if I failed at the, at, at taking care of people and doing the right thing by our, our employees, I'd be devastated. Um, yeah. But well, that's why people love working there. And that's why you've built this insane kick-ass company. Like it's, it's so cool to watch. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is a, it is a great place, great place to work. And um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be proud of. And, you know, I think, you know, the, you know, the difference between a statement and policy is consistency. And, and so, so we, we say all the same thing every other company does, but I think we effectively have walked the walk for 90 years and um and it's, 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 uh, I, I haven't stated the company because it's my family's business. I've stated the company because I love the company. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest news and episodes. You can also contact us at podcast at fueltalent.com. To provide feedback, ask questions, and share topics or guests you would like us to cover in the future. We hope you feel inspired by our guests and that we have helped fuel your day. Join us next time for another episode of What Fuels You.